And Father, we just lift up our hands in your presence, knowing that, Father, without you, we are nothing. Without you, we have no hope. We want to thank you tonight for allowing us into your presence. And Lord, we just take all of the distractions of the day, all of the busyness of the day, all of the cares of the day, and Father, right now, we just place them at your feet. And Lord, we just dedicate and commit this time to you. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would open up our hearts to hear the Father speaking to us. Jesus, teach us your word. Holy Spirit, teach us your word. You are our teacher. You are our helper. And so tonight, we ask you to teach us. Draw us into a closer relationship with the Father, with the covenant God, with the God that loves us with an everlasting love. And Lord, tonight we thank you for this time. And in the precious name, the name that is above every name, we give you all of the glory and the honor. That's the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Okay, if you don't have a booklet... You can go out to the back and see Victoria, and there are some extra booklets out there. We are in Change Our World School of Prayer, Lesson 3, The Prayer Warrior's Prayer Life. We are in Lesson 2 in Booklet 3. You can go ahead and be seated. What we've been talking about are the seven essentials, the imperatives, and the pillars for an effective prayer life. We've been studying about the goal of prayer, which is not only to impact our own personal life, and a lot of times that what, that's what we think prayer is, is just to get what we want, to impact our own personal life. But it's also to impact the world, to make a change, to make a difference in this world. We talked about last week that there are certain essentials that are necessary. Now, if you remember, an essential was something that was extremely important, And that we talked about the imperatives, which were of vital importance, urgent. Also, they are authoritative commands. And then we talked about the pillars. So what we are doing is we are building a house on a solid foundation. And what we're doing is we are putting up these pillars to build a strong house that's not going to fall in the times of trouble. And a pillar is a thing of support. It's something that we can rely on, and it is essential. And these are the things that we need to have an effective prayer life. We talked about the scripture in James chapter 5, verse 16, how the prayers of a righteous man, they accomplish much. The effective prayers of a righteous man accomplish much. And so... When we come to pray, when we come before God in prayer, we don't want to just say empty, vain words, right? We want to make a difference. We want our prayers to have an impact, not only in our own personal life, but in the world. So that's what we're studying about. So in Essential One, it was the having the right concept of prayer. Imperative One was having a right understanding of both God and prayer, and then our first pillar was having a right understanding of the concept of God. Because when we know God, we can pray effectively. So now we're in in our booklet. If you go to lesson two, page 46, we're going to talk about the second essential. So if you can get ready to fill in the blanks. The effective prayer life needs to have a strong prayer conviction. So our first one was we need to have a right concept of who God is. This second one is we need to have a strong prayer conviction. Now, conviction is something that a firmly held belief I know that it's true. I know that it's right. It's a firm conviction. 
I am convinced of what I am saying. I am convinced that God's word is true. That's a conviction. I am convinced. And so we need to have a strong prayer conviction that God has called us to prayer. And that prayer makes a difference. So our imperative, number two, is for a powerful prayer life, we must believe that prayer works. So we're in in the book here on page 46. For a powerful prayer life, we must believe that prayer works. Now I'm going to tell you a little little story. We were talking today during our lunch hour, and one of the pastors was telling us a story when he was just a young boy, and he had went to some other country to go preach, and as he was preaching, he mentioned that the lights had went out, and it got dark there, and they were praying, and one of the ladies came running up when the lights went on and was telling the pastor that it was gone. It was gone. She had a big tumor on her side, and it was gone. She was healed. And he said, oh, my God, I don't believe it. <laughs> and the pastor, the, the head pastor of that church said, what do you mean? You don't believe in miracles? And he said, no, 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 I do believe in miracles, but I don't believe what I just saw. You know, so... Sometimes we need to remember to have a strong prayer life. We need to have a strong conviction that prayer works. And our second pillar is faith. If you fill in your, fill in your blank, pillar number two is faith. So I need to have faith and conviction that my prayers make a difference. Can you say that? My prayers make a difference. And you know, if I have the right concept of who God is, then I can have faith. And if I have faith, I can have a strong conviction that my prayer is going to make a difference. I tell you what, every time I get down on my knees to pray, every time that you get down on your knees to pray, you have a conviction that something is going to happen, right? There's a change going to take place. And we're going to read the scripture here in Psalm 91, 15 in your book. It says, when they call on me. Now, I want you to get your pencil. What does it say next? Circle that. I will answer. And then what? When? And then what? Okay, so I want you to circle that. I will answer, I will be with them, and I will rescue them. See, so when God, when we call upon the name of God, he says, I will answer. I will be with you in your trouble, and I will rescue you, and I will honor you. Now, I have to ask myself the question, when who calls? Now, if you read those previous verses, and I don't want to go back because of time, because I have a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. But when you read the rest of that verse, you can, or chapter, chapter 91, when they call, so who is he talking about? When who calls? The Bible says, those who set their love upon me. So those that love God, those are the people who have a deep longing for God, those who cling to God. And if you read in the, in the previous verses, it says, those who know my name. Those are the ones that when they call on God, God says, I will answer them. So we have to ask ourselves, do I love God? Do I know God's name? Do I have that deep longing for God? If I do, then I can be guaranteed that God is hearing me when I pray, and he's going to answer me. Now, those who know my name. Let me tell you something about that word know. In the Hebrew, that word is yara. And it means to have a relationship. It means to have an understanding. It means to enter into intimacy. Or enter into a covenant together. Now, I can tell you something. I know pastor. 
You know pastor in a sense, right? But I really know pastor. We've been married for 51 years. I really know pastor. Now, see, that's the kind of relationship that we need to have with God. I can know about God, but to really have a covenant relationship with God. And nobody knows your partner like you, right? Nobody knows your spouse like you do. God is calling us to that same kind of relationship. Know me. Have a relationship with me. You know, that word know also means to be intertwined together. So when you take a rope, a three-cord three strand, the Bible says, cannot easily be broken. And when we get intertwined with God, that relationship is not going to be broken. We may go through some periods and times of trouble, but we know God. We have a relationship with him. In Daniel 11.32, it says, But the people who know their God shall be strong, and they shall carry out great exploits. I like another translation. It says, The people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. They're going to stand firm and take action. So when you stop to think about it, a knowledge of God combined with the strength and the power of God, that is the most powerful force against evil in this world. So you see, it's not just knowing about God, but it is knowing God, having a relationship with him. And as believers, as this scripture says, we're not just going to stand by. We're going to make things happen. Charles Spurgeon, who many of you, I'm sure, have heard some of his stuff or read some of his stuff, he said something that I thought was really good. And I'm going to share that with you. He says, a church that does not exist to reclaim heathenism, and that's sinners, to fight evil, to destroy error, to put down falsehoods, a church that does not exist to take the side of the poor, to denounce injustice, and to hold up righteousness, is a church that has no right to be here. Not for yourself. Oh, church, do you exist? Not for yourself. Any more than Christ existed for himself. I read that and I said, oh, God, we need you. We need you. You know, and that, that describes that scripture, that the people who do know their God, they will stand against evil. They will do something. They will take action. So what does it mean to know God's name? Where he's talking about those who know my name. What does that mean? It means to know the qualities of God, to know the characters of God, and to know the promises of God. You know, just as we were singing that song, some of the names of God came up. To know the names of God. You know, it's not just knowing a name, but when you know the name of God, you know the character and the meaning and the truth behind that name. You know, one of the names of God is Jehovah. That means that he is a God who is in covenant with his people. Jehovah Jireh, that is the name of God that says the Lord will provide. Now, I'm going to ask you, have you ever been in a situation where you needed something? And you prayed and asked God, whatever the situation was, and God answered you? He was Jehovah Jireh to you. The God who provides. What about Jehovah Shalom? Have you ever been so overwhelmed that you don't know what to do? To turn to the right or left, to sit, to stay, to whatever. And all of a sudden, the peace that passes all understanding has just come in. We knew him as Jehovah Shalom. The God, our peace. What about Jehovah Shammah? You know what that means? The Lord is there. 
Where? The Lord is there in the middle of your trouble. The Lord is there in the middle of your situation. The Lord is there no matter what's going on. He is there. Has he been there for you? Have you felt his presence in time of distance, in times of trouble? The Lord is there. And you know, his name is incomparable in power, incomparable in authority. And we talked about this last week. He is omnipotent. Omnipotent, all-powerful, above everything, everyone, every situation. He is all-powerful. Remember the omniscience. Let me slow down. Omniscience. He is all-knowing. He knows what you're going through. He knows everything about your situation. This is the God that we serve. Omnipresent. He is here with us. In the middle of everything that's going on in our world today, he is here with us. In Zechariah 13.9, it says, I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will test them for purity as gold is tested. And then they will pray to me by name. They will pray to me by name. What do you need from God? Pray to me by name, he said. Do you need to pray to him as Jehovah Jireh, the God who will provide? Does he need to be Jehovah Shalom, peace in the midst of your circumstances? You pray to him, he says, by name. I will answer them personally. I will say, that's my people. And they will say, God, my God. That's a personal relationship right there that it's talking about. In the New King James Version, it says, the Lord is my God. In this other translation, it says, my God, my God. They will say, my God. When? When they pray to him by name. So we've got to know who God is. We've got to know his characteristics. We've got to know his word, his truth. See, we can't be pleasing to God. We can't even talk to God without faith. So what is faith? Faith is the confident assurance that what we hope for, and we're in the booklet on page 47, faith is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It is the evidence of things that we cannot yet see. In the Amplified Version, it says, now faith is the assurance or the confirmation, the title deed of the things that we hope for, being proof of the things that we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith. The confident assurance. The confirmation. The title deed. See, God has already given us promises. Jesus has already died on the cross. Jesus has already given us everything that we have need of. We have the title deed. Right here in the word of God, that is the title deed of whatever it is that we have need of. The title deed, is it written in there? If it's written in there, it is guaranteed. So faith is, I like what someone said, another version of this. This is man's version, but I like what they said. Faith is reaching into nowhere, grabbing a hold of nothing, and hanging on to it. Until it becomes something. So how do we do that? With our mind and our heart. We reach out. Reach out. Reach out with me. We reach out into nowhere. Grab a hold of something. And you hang on until it becomes something. That's faith. You don't let go. 
because it's already guaranteed. You have the title deed right here in the Word of God. Dick Eastman in, is the author of the uh, Change Your World School of Prayer. And he was teaching how prayer makes a difference. And after he got done teaching, they took a break, and a lady came up to him and asked him, Brother Eastman, can you describe an effective prayer life, what it means to have an effective prayer life in a nutshell? You know, I don't want the big, long version. I just want a nutshell. And he said he stopped and thought about it for a minute. And this is the answer that he gave the lady. He said, ma'am, something happens when I pray that would not happen if I don't. Therefore, if I do not pray today, something goes undone in God's kingdom plan for my life and in the lives of those who may have been touched by my prayers. That's conviction in prayer. Let me read it to you again. Listen. Something happens when I pray that would not happen if I don't. Therefore, if I do not pray today, something goes undone in God's kingdom plan for my life and in the lives of those who may have been touched by my prayers. Did I pray today? If not, something was left undone. So essential number three, if you look in your book, page 47, essential number three, the effective prayer life needs a strong prayer catalyst. And you can fill in the blank. The catalyst is what brings all of our prayer together. It just kind of gathers it all up and pulls everything together. See, a catalyst, when you define a catalyst in the dictionary, it says a substance that modifies or increases the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. It's something that precipitates a process or an event without being changed by the consequences. Now that kind of sounds like, phew, what? <laughs> right? But what they're saying is a catalyst is what causes something to happen. It's an event or a person that creates change but is not changed in the process. Now, you and I have been saved by the blood of Jesus, right? There was a change that took place in our lives, right? But in the process of God changing us, he was not changed, right? Even though we went through a change, he did not change. We're going to talk a little bit more about this. But imperative number three in your book, for a powerful prayer life, we must understand prayer's most essential ingredient. And this brings us to pillar number three. The most essential Ingredient in prayer is pillar number three, and that is Jesus' name. This is our effective catalyst for prayer. This is what pulls everything together when we pray, is Jesus. The scripture in John 14, 12 through 14 in our booklet, it says, the truth is, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, because the work of the Son brings glory to the Father. Yes, ask anything in my name, and I will do it. Well, Jesus was on the earth with his disciples, they didn't have to worry about anything because Jesus was with them, and he supplied all of their needs as they did the work. But now he's getting ready to return back to the Father. He's going back to heaven. And he left them with a great privilege, the privilege and the gift of prayer. And here he is. He's promising them that if you ask anything in my name, I'm going to do it for you. 
And he promised to answer prayer so that the Father would be glorified. Not so that we could rejoice and be happy and have everything that we need, but so that the Father would be glorified. And so to pray in Jesus' name means to pray for God's glory, asking whatever he himself would ask. So you see, ask in my name, it's not a magical formula. A lot of times we think that, you know, we can rub like the genie on the bottle and ask, oh, I want a new car, I want a new house, I want a new dress, I want my children to change, I want all these things. But it's not a magical formula. The Bible says, but the, the prayers of the believers, he's talking to us. We are Christ's representatives. We are ambassadors for Christ. We're doing business in his name. So our request will be answered when I do business in his name and do it as he would do it. So that word name here in this scripture is the word onoma, O-N-O-M-A. And it, it, the meaning of it is it represents full authority. So when I pray in the name of Jesus, I am representing God's full authority or the full authority of Jesus Christ. And by praying in the name of Jesus, a believer is actually standing in the physical place of Jesus as if Jesus was here, acting on his behalf and operating in his authority. So being a believer and being an ambassador for Christ, you know, here's probably the easiest way to explain it. Many of you have watched the news, and you've heard Jen Paskey, right? And she stands in the full authority of the President of the United States. She is speaking on behalf of the President. She has full authority to speak in his name. She's powerful, right? Well, as ambassadors and as believers, we have that full authority to speak in the name of Jesus. And it doesn't mean ask whatever you will. The Bible tells us we don't get what we ask for because we ask to consume it upon our own lust. And asking for something to consume upon our own lust is not giving glory to God. So what brings glory to God? What do you think would bring glory to God? Somebody shoot out a, an answer. Anything that glorifies God personally. So give me an idea. What would glorify God? Amen, amen. If you didn't hear that, being a living testimony, living it out, walking it out, brings glory to God. Lifting him up. Okay, when we lift up the name of God, we're bringing him honor and glory. Vivian? Okay, so when we bring other people to Christ, that brings God glory, right? So how are our, the prayers that we're praying? Are we asking God to help us to walk upright, to be righteous, and, and to follow after truth and obedience? Are the words that we're praying bringing honor and glory to God? Are we lifting up his name? Are we praying for souls? If we are, we are bringing honor to God, and we are praying in Jesus' name. Now, do you think that Jesus, as he went about, the Bible tells us that he would get up early in the morning, and he would go up into the mountain, or he'd go somewhere aside by himself to pray. Do you think he was praying, Father, would you give me a new donkey? Father, I need some new sandals. Do you think that was on his prayer list? What do you think was on his prayer list? People. People. The hurts. 
the sorrows, the need of salvation was what was on his list. So when we ask in his name, what it is meaning is not just ask for whatever you want, but ask according to his will. If it's in the word, he will do it. If it brings God glory, he will do it. Now, let me ask you another question. Are you praying for a loved one that needs to be brought to Christ? Would that bring God glory? Did he ever say in his word anything about people being saved? He did, right? That's why Jesus came, right? So you see, we have a solid foundation to stand on. So when I ask God for the salvation, for a turning back, whatever it is, to him, we can be guaranteed that he will answer it because it brings him glory. So before you ever utter another prayer, say, is this prayer going to bring God glory? You know, the very first time after Jesus had ascended back into heaven, the very first time that we hear this phrase in Jesus' name is in Acts chapter 3. You remember the story that Peter and John, they were on their way to the temple to pray. And the Bible tells us that there was a man that was lame from birth, laying at the gate, right? And what was he doing? He was asking for alms. He was asking for money, right? And what did they say to him? Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give to you. And in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And you know what he did? He even extended his hand, took the man by the hand, and lifted him up. Let me tell you what happened. That man was healed. He had been lame from birth. And you'd, it caused a great stink in the city. People were upset that this man was healed. Right after that, the Bible tells us, read that whole chapter in Acts chapter 3. Right after that, the Bible tells us that 5,000 people believed. And then what happened? Peter and John were arrested. And the Sanhedrin, the council, said, by what power or what name have you done this? You see, even the council understood that there was power in the name. By what power or by what name have you done this? And they said, let it be known to you all that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom the one whom you crucified, the one who was raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. So by what power and by what name? By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, this man stands before you whole. Right after that, the name of Jesus was forbidden. They said, uh-uh, no more. No more speaking that name. But no one could deny that that miracle had taken place. And you know, they threatened the disciples not to speak or to teach in that name. Why? Because they knew they saw that in that name, just speaking that name, just speaking the name of Jesus, there was power and there was authority. So they told them, don't speak in that name anymore. They threatened them. If you speak in the name of Jesus, they threatened them. In Acts chapter 4, verse 17, it says, But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. And what did the, 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 uh, Peter and John say? We must obey God and not man. 
You see, the council didn't want the message of the gospel to go forth, right? So they did whatever they could to stop the name of Jesus from being spread. And aren't we living that same thing today? They don't want us to speak the name of Jesus. They want to close our churches down. They want to stop the Christians from going forth. But what do we do? We are to obey God. Because there is power in that name. Let me tell you exactly what happened. On the, there were 120 people praying up in the upper room in Acts chapter 1. And from that 120, the Bible tells us that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were added to the church. And right after the healing of that man, another 5,000 believers came. Just at the name of Jesus. The Bible tells us believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both men and women. You see, Satan has attempted to silence the church. Who is the church? We are, right? Hasn't he attempted to silence us? Don't people say, don't tell me about your Jesus? Isn't the world telling us to be silent? Keep that stuff to yourself. We don't want to hear it. Aren't they censoring and shutting off a lot of people who are preaching truth? Because the world and Satan knows, just like the Sanhedrin and the council knew, that there was power, there was change, there was authority in that name. So there is power in the name of Jesus. You know, one of the things that the name of Jesus did, it brought salvation. In Acts 4.12, it says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? Page 48 in your booklet. To pray in Jesus' name is to pray within the limits of his power. See, you're not depending on your own power. You're not depending upon your own words. You're not depending upon your ability. You are depending upon the power of God. You see, we serve, let me remind you, a God who is omnipotent, Omni meaning all, potent meaning power. We serve a God that is all powerful, whose name is above every name, whose power is above every power, every situation. His name has full authority. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and he gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue confess, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. The name that is above every name. Now, I want you to stop for a second. What is it that you're praying for? Just think about it in your mind. Every one of you has a particular need, right? Now, I want you to think about what that need is. Is it a person? Just think about their name. Is it a situation? Think about that. Okay, so hold on to that in your mind. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. So who is it you're praying for? What is it you're praying for? The name that is above addiction. The name that is above someone who's running from God. The name that is above a physical condition. The name that is above your financial situation. No matter what it is. When we speak the name of Jesus, we have all power and all authority because we stand as an ambassador 
speaking on behalf of God, we have the authority to speak in his name. You remember in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, again, they were on their way to prayer. And you remember the story that there was a demon-possessed girl that followed them. And she just kept tormenting them for days. These men are preaching in the name of God. You know, she, she just kept on following them and tormenting them. And finally, the Bible tells us that they got kind of upset and annoyed with this young girl. And finally, enough was enough. And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. She was demon-possessed. And the Bible says that at that moment, at that moment, that spirit left her. This is showing us that at the name of Jesus, there is all power and all authority. So we have a catalyst. We have something so powerful, the name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name. So in your book, number two, the prayer to pray in Jesus' name is to pray within the limits of his will. Let me ask you a question. What is God's will? And in order to know God's will, we need to know what was Jesus' purpose. And what was Jesus' purpose? To save the lost. He came to seek and save the lost, right? So when we pray in God's will, we're praying the very same prayers that Jesus prayed, that the Father had given him that same heart of love and compassion. It was that all would be saved. And then number three, to pray in Jesus' name is to pray within the limits of his nature. What is God's nature? God's nature is truth. God's nature is compassion. God's nature is forgiveness. We can go on here all night long, and every one of us can give a a, a characteristic of the nature of God. And so when we pray in God's nature, we are praying with God's same heart. He has a heart of compassion. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He doesn't want his people to suffer. He doesn't want that. What does the Bible tell us? That Jesus looked at the crowd. He looked out at the multitude. And his heart broke. Because he was filled with compassion for the people. And so when we pray in the nature of God, we are praying in that very same characteristic. A characteristic of love, compassion, concern, care. In John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, when we pray, that's how we've got to pray. We've got to understand that the Word of God is truth. And if it's written here in the Word of God, then it is true. And we can stand on it. We can bank on it. It is guaranteed. So in his name or in his nature means that the believer can ask anything that will honor his name, that will bring praise to his name, that will lead to his name being lifted up. You see, the believer is not going to ask anything that will, or shouldn't anyway, that would detract, lower, or lead away from God's name. Let's look at the scripture in Proverbs 18.10 in the book. It says, the name of the Lord is is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. So essential number four, the effective prayer life needs a strong prayer confidence. What is confidence? Confidence is a strong belief that you can rely on someone or something to have confidence, to have a firm trust. You know, you're sitting on that chair and you have confidence 
that it's going to hold you up, right? That's confidence, trust. I trust that the seed is going to hold me up. Well, you know what? We can have confidence when we approach God. In John 5, 14, it says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. This is the confidence that we have. It's guaranteed. It's truth. We can trust it. That word confidence in the Greek is parousia. It means to have boldness, to have an assurance, and to not doubt. See, that's what we should have when we pray. We should have a confidence and not doubt. That way we can approach the throne of grace, the Bible says, with boldness and with confidence, knowing that anything that we ask, it will be done for us. So what gives us this confidence? If we ask in his will. If we ask in his will, he's going to hear us. So when we know God's will and we ask in agreement with his will, we can be confident, 100% confident that God hears us and he's going to answer us. So when we pray, we need to have confidence that God listens. And you know what he listens for? He listens for his word. And when he listens for his word and we speak his word in our prayers, God is going to respond. It may not be today, and it may not be tomorrow, and it may be longer than I want to wait, but he is going to respond. Because you know what's happening right now? We don't see what we ask for right now at this minute. But you know what is happening in the spirit realm the Holy Spirit is going to the very heart of that person, and he is beginning to show them the need that they have for God the Father, for Jesus Christ's forgiveness. God is beginning to change their heart. And you see what happens when conviction comes upon them. They get irritated. They get angry. I always tell everybody, you know what, when they tell you, don't tell me about your God. I don't want to hear it anymore. Stop praying for me. That's a 100% guarantee that the Holy Spirit is convicting them. And when that happens, I say, you know what, they can run, but they can't hide. Because one day, they're going to run right into the arms of Jesus Christ. That is the confidence that we can have because God spoke it in his word, and it is 100% according to the word. So you know what? It may not be today, but you know what? In the meantime, when God is working in their heart, God is also working in our heart. He's changing us. You know what he's doing? He's developing some patience. He's developing some faith in us. So imperative number four, for a powerful prayer life, we must rest completely in the integrity of God's word. For a powerful prayer life, we must rest completely in the integrity of God's word. You know, sometimes we have a hard time finding rest when we're praying for a situation or we see such a big mess all around us. But what does this say? We must rest completely in the integrity of God's word. So our fourth pillar is scripture. And you could fill in the blank in your book. Our fourth pillar is scripture or God's word. In Hebrews 4.16, it says, let us then approach the throne of grace with what? With confidence. And what did confidence mean? It meant to trust, right? An assurance. So let us Approach the throne of grace with confidence, with trust, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So how do we build that confidence in prayer? How can I get a hold of that confidence so that when I pray, I can walk, get up off my knees, and turn around and walk away and know 
that God heard me. How can I develop that confidence? Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing. And hearing what? Tell me that again. Hearing the word of God. Your faith will never grow if you are not in the word of God. You know, we talk about the armor of God. And the Bible tells us to put on salvation as your helmet, to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, pray at all times on every occasion in the power of the Holy Spirit. Then it tells us stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all Christians everywhere. So, you know, when we read that scripture, it tells us put on the helmet of salvation, put on the belt of truth, the, the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation. So we're here all dressed, right? You know, all of that scripture there is an analogy. Every one of those parts of the armor is an analogy. There's one that is not. The sword of the Spirit. That is the only thing that you could take up in your hand that is true and visible. You can hold on to it. The rest of the armor is an analogy. It's a story. But you can hold on to the sword. You can hold on to God's word. It is truth. First Thessalonians, Thessalonians 2.13, it says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it. Not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. We received the word of God. We were changed. We were saved. How many of you know 100% guarantee that Jesus Christ's blood was sufficient for you? How many of you can you say, I am saved? Saved from this sinful, evil world. My destiny is heaven. And that day, it was the word of God that made that change in your life. And that word, the Bible says, effectively works in you. And that word, effectively works, is the Greek word energio, energio. E-N-E-R-G-E-O. That word is the energy inside of you, meaning the energy within. So the day that you believed God's word, his word became the energy inside of you. It's working inside of you. You have the name of Jesus, the power and the authority, the energy, the strength, everything that you need. So you see, we don't give up. We don't fall back because we have the truth of God's word that was spoken to us. It became a part of us. I'm going to close with this. Many of you have heard of a man by the name of George, George Mueller, a great man of prayer. He was from Great Britain, and he had an orphanage. And in this orphanage, they said he had over 3,000 kids. And every day he would pray for food and for whatever it was that they had need of, and God always supplied. And he said that God always answered his prayer. So at the age of 90, he was asked, what is the secret to your praying? And they said that he took his Bible and he held it up and he said, I never ask anything without backing it up with God's word. He said, I plead the promises of God. And when I plead the promises of God, God can't turn me down. God can't back out on what he's already spoken he said, how could it be otherwise? I am praying. How was he praying? 
in the Word of God. Well, at that point, at 90 years old, he had a journal or journals, and they said that he had journaled over 50,000 prayer requests that God had answered. Can you imagine that? Journals, books of prayers that had been answered. And a young man came up to him and he said, Brother Mueller, has God answered every one of your prayers? And he stopped for a minute and he thought, well, you know, my dear friend has asked me to pray for his son and his son is not yet saved. But he, he, he will be. He had that confidence. Well, George Mueller died at the age of 93. And before he died, he didn't see that young man come to Christ. But look at this. At age 93, they're having his service. And this young man walked into the church to honor the life of George Mueller, his father's friend. And it was in that service that day that this young man gave his life to Christ. So what am I telling you? I'm telling you, hold on. Hold on to the word of God because God's word is truth. So now I want you to reach out. Take a hold of something. What is it? And you hold on to it. Until it becomes something. Until it becomes substance. I don't care if it's that young son. I don't care if it's that daughter. I don't care what the situation is. You hold on to it. Because God has already spoken and it is a word that he desires for all to be saved. That means your loved one. You know, when I, when I first got saved... I thought, gee, this is really good. None of my family was saved. We were all religious, but we were lost. And I thought, gee, I must have some kind of favor with God. You know, that he saved me first. And one day we were in service, and Brother Shambach was preaching, and he said something that day that changed my life. He said, when God saves you, a family, he always starts with the worst. <laughs> because when God saves the worst, you know what? We become a light. We become a testimony because people knew what you were before. And so if God saved you, he started with the worst. So you know what? Those who we think are worse than us, they really are not. God says, I'll put them off because I, you know, they're not going to be as tough as this one was. And so you reach out and you take a hold of nothing. And you hang on until it becomes something. So what I want to leave you with tonight is we need to pray according to the will of God according to his word, and in the power and the authority of the name of God. And you know what? We're not going to let go. We're not going to let go. What is that one dog that bites down the, the pit bull? I'm going to tell you, you become a pit bull. You get that pit bull dog faith. You hold on to it and you don't let go. You hold on to the promises of God. You hold on to the name of Jesus Christ. The name that is above every name. Because one day at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. In your booklet, we have the afterthoughts, the ponder and pray. You know what I'm going to ask you to do this week? is I want you to take Psalm 20. It's only nine verses. And I want you to read it. And I want you to write a prayer out of Psalm 20. Your own personal prayer, as if you were praying that back to God. Okay? Can you do that? And when we come back together... I want to hear your prayers. 
Because we need to pray according to the word. So, Father, tonight we just want to thank you. What power is in that name? What power? That, Lord, just at the name, this man was healed who had been lame from birth. At the name, this demon-possessed girl was set free. Lord, at your name, my life was changed. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you have given us such a beautiful name, the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. And Lord, I thank you that we can reach out and take a hold of your word. And we can stand. We can stand, Lord. We can take your sword and we can stand. We don't have to back up. We don't have to give in. We have the truth of your word. And we thank you that we serve an omnipotent God. We serve a God that is all powerful, who has all authority. And Father, we thank you. We thank you. I'm going to ask you to stand. And Jordan, you can go ahead and start that song. We have a couple of special prayer requests. One of them is Brother Johnny Cordova, our Brother Johnny. He's in the hospital, and they're having a lot of complications. He's not doing very well. And they're very concerned about him. And so we need to lift him up in prayer. He needs a miracle. He needs a miracle. We need God to just go to that hospital bed and touch him. Right now he's on a ventilator and uh, he's, he's just in a bad situation. No, it's not COVID, no. He had surgery yesterday. And just a lot of different things have happened since the surgery. So, And then also for Sister Stella Martinez, she was in the hospital also. Now she's in a rehab. And again, I think it's a, like a heart condition or something. But we need to keep these people in our prayers. And so as we get ready to close, I want us to pray in agreement. You know what your prayer request is. You know what you want from God. So as we pray together, I want you to just call out to God. You know, I don't have to do all the praying. You know how to pray. You know how to cry out to God. So do it. And let's do it together. If two on earth agree as touching anything that they shall ask, it will be what? Done. So, Father, we just come before you, and we thank you, Lord, that we can come before you, and we can just lift up the name that is above every name. Father, we just speak your word to our brother Johnny, and Lord, we just send the word of healing. Lord, you said you sent your word, and they were healed. Father, we pray that you would go to Johnny's bedside there in that hospital, and Father, I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would just get a hold of his spirit, Lord. And Father, that you would cause the word of God to come alive within him. We speak to every cell. We speak to every tissue and to every organ in his body. And Father, we pray that you would just manifest a healing miracle in his body. Lord, for your glory, for your honor. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God that heals his people. We thank you, Father. We pray for his wife, Lord, and we pray, Father, that your peace would just come upon her. That, Father, she would be able to rest peacefully in you, Lord, tonight. Knowing that Johnny is in your hands. You have him in the palm of your hands, Lord. And so, Father, we're thanking you for a manifestation of healing to take place. Father, give his body a good night rest. And, Lord, in the morning, I pray that they'd be able to take all of the machines off of him and that his body would begin to respond to your word. 
We thank you, Father, for Sister Stella. We thank you, Lord, that you are healing her. And we pray, Lord, that you would just continue the work. Strengthen her body. Strengthen her spirit, Lord. Strengthen her emotions. And, Father, even where she's at, I pray that you would give her the opportunity to speak to others about the goodness of God. And, Father, we thank you. And the Lord, tonight we pray, dear God, and we lift up every prayer request to you. The, what's on the heart of your people, you know. And so, Father, tonight we pray according to your will. We pray, dear God, in the name of Jesus, with your power and with your authority. And, Father, we take a hold of something. Reach out into nowhere and take a hold of something. And, Father, we speak as even though we don't see it, we're thanking you, Father. And we're offering up a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you that you hear us when we call. You said you will hear us. You will answer us when we call. And so, Lord, we stand on your word. But you are a God that does not lie. You are a God that is faithful to his word. And I thank you, Lord, that we have a strong foundation. We have a foundation. 